Hey Axis and Allies players, this is The Good Captain and welcome to my 10th video in my 12 part series on Axis and Allies Anniversary Edition 1941 setup. This video will cover the UK turn. The UK is the fourth player to go out of six. Germany, Russia, and Japan have gone, so it goes without saying that I've taken the liberty of just executing what I think to be the most ideal G1 opener, but it, again, it really doesn't matter what kind of Barbarossa has happened, but Barbarossa has happened, the Russians have done the Belarusian bump, and the Japanese have taken their turn in the Pacific. Before I go into purchases, I just want to set the stage a little bit more. Germany's attack in this example has netted Egypt successfully with one German armor left over. That is the slightly more probable outcome than not. Sometimes there will be two German tanks. Sometimes there will be no units here. Sometimes there will be a British fighter there and it will remain in British hands. But because it's an allied turn, I want to be a little bit lenient towards the Axis. So uh, we have two subs and a cruiser in the Atlantic to knock out. Uh, we've assumed the Germans have only taken a single sub casualty in C zone two. Okay, so now let's talk about the purchasing options available to this power. The UK is unique in that it is the power that starts out with the most amount of starting income, even more than the United States. The UK starts with 43 IPCs. Now rest assured that this is the most amount of IPCs you'll earn as this power on any given turn more than likely, unless the game is nearing its end and the Axis player just hasn't conceded yet. At any rate, it's very important that we get a, a strong first turn purchase out as the UK player. And for the first and only time in this video series, I can't explicitly state what the best first turn purchase is. And the reason for this is because as the UK player, the two most powerful Axis players have gone in front of you and you are a world power, right? They're are British troops all over the game board. It's the only power that's like this. You've got decisions to make in the Middle East and in India, you've got decisions to make in Africa, even in the Pacific, you've, you've got to make some decisions. It's a little difficult to have a single purchase that is a universal response to any version of how the Axis intend to prosecute the war. Okay, with that out of the way, let me say that I'm not completely blind to what we need to do as the UK. So let's start with a couple of purchases I feel very strongly need to be made regardless of what you do with the rest of the IPCs. And that foundational purchase is an aircraft carrier and a transport. Really, no matter what has happened anywhere on the board, building these two pieces on your first turn should be a minimum purchase. This purchase is, of course, 21 IPCs. Aircraft carriers are only 14 in this version of the game, and that leaves us with 22. And though I can't say explicitly what to do with this 22 IPCs, let me give anyone who's interested a few pointers and my best advice. Sometimes when you're playing Axis and Allies and you're not sure about what purchase to make, it helps to cancel out things you know you don't need. And I like to do that with the UK on the first turn. Now, almost certainly we're never going to need submarines, cruisers, or battleships. So we can get rid of those. Of course, we don't need any more carriers. We just bought one. We don't need any anti-aircraft guns. And it's really unlikely that there's a high demand for ground units or bombers. So that leaves fighters, destroyers, another transport, industrial complex maybe, or even infantry as potential purchases. And in my opinion, an argument can be made for any or all of these pieces, but we are going to have to choose. So I'm going to take it back to the strategic map now so that we can analyze the board situation that we have in this example. So when I'm looking at the strategic map and deciding about my final purchases, I'm looking at the UK turn one pressure points. And there are a few. One, did the Russians do the bump? If they did, we know those fighters are heading over there. How successful or how unsuccessful was the German bid for Egypt? Right now there's one tank, but there could be sometimes more, right? There could be two tanks, there could be two tanks and an artillery. Uh, there could be a British fighter there. Maybe we uh, shot each other to pieces, but we still have the fighter remaining. That can absolutely happen. And then lastly, and perhaps most important, is how well or how badly did the Battle of the Atlantic go? 
Uh, in this case, we only took out one submarine and lost everything, but it can happen where you have, say, the UK transport still up here in C zone two. And all of these affect your decision-making process on how to spend the remaining IPCs. But given this situation, I will reveal that my purchase would be a destroyer, a fighter, and one infantry. And I'll reveal more about why I made this specific purchase towards the end of the video, but I just wanna remind the viewers that building an aircraft carrier and a transport, no matter what has happened anywhere on the board on the UK-1, is generally speaking, always a good idea. So I'm gonna go ahead and move this purchase down into the mobilization zone, and then get on with the combat movement phase. And I'll start in the northwest corner of the board here, but before I do, just one other piece of advice. When you're making a purchase where you're not 100% certain what you need to prosecute the rest of the war, do the combat move, but don't roll any dice. You might wanna take a picture before you do this thing, but when you push the pieces around and kinda of see how things look at the end of the combat move and likely at the end of the combat, then you can make a better purchase. So if you're struggling with a purchase option, just take a picture of the board, push the plastic to see how it looks, and if it's to your liking, then make the final decision on whatever money you have remaining. At any rate, the priority in this section of the board for the UK on this turn is to clear as much of the Atlantic as possible. So we are gonna begin by moving one fighter off the UK on its way to Belarusia. We're gonna stop and sink this transport. The rest of the RAF He's gonna pitch in against this cruiser-submarine combo along with the destroyer from C-Zone 12. And the remaining combat naval units will both head up to C-Zone 2. Now, I'm already anticipating placing my naval units in C-Zone 2. This is sort of your home base. This is the safe zone. We've got a Russian sub here. Uh, after we sink this German sub, we've got a destroyer a transport, an aircraft carrier, and a fighter all going into C-Zone 2, and that's going to be our hub. We'll move the fleet to a strategically better position on turn two, but we wanna build it up safely on this turn. So we'll look something like this at the end of the combat movement phase, and that's pretty much it for this phase. I'm not gonna say there's no combat move opportunities as the UK player in Africa, the Middle East, and the South Pacific, It'll just be very rare and it usually materializes as some sort of misstep by the Japanese or German player or something manufactured like a, a skewed dice result. But for the combat phase, what's most likely to happen is of course the transport will be sunk and nearly as automatic this submarine will be sunk. And lastly, this battle, this one's not a guarantee. You really don't wanna lose either of these aircraft, so we're gonna retreat as soon as we lose the destroyer, which more likely than not will be in the first round of combat. So hopefully we get both kills, but it could be that we only swap the destroyer for the submarine. And if this is the case, and we'll say it's the case, the British will retreat their aircraft and we move to the non-combat. And this is a pretty swift non-combat move. So of course the fighters we know are going to Belarusia, integral to the defense there. The infantry in Western Canada will come to Eastern Canada and we'll of course load the armor up on this transport and drop it off in the United Kingdom. And finally, we'll move this bomber to the Caucasus, yes, the Caucasus is just in range, and this is a nice segue to what to do as the British in the middle of the board. So I can't really talk about these non-combat moves without talking about mid and long range goals as the UK. And one of the mid range goals that you should have as the United Kingdom player is to control the Suez Canal as much as you can. You only need to really have one side of it, but do not let the Italian fleet get out into the Indian Ocean. It will cause a massive headache if you do. Coupled with that is the problem of what to do with India. Now, in my opinion, the most efficient Japanese player will stack up on India on its first turn to make sure it goes down on Japan's second turn. And the best thing we can do in both cases to accomplish both missions, it's a two birds with one stone sort of situation, 
is non-com the whole force into Persia. You want every piece that you can get in there. So let's get five infantry and an artillery in there backed up by British air out of the Caucasus. Of course, the Union of South Africa infantries come up into Rhodesia. There's no reason not to. It helps to control the center of the continent of Africa, especially if the Germans have broken through in Egypt like they've done here. And before we move to Australia, I just wanna say one thing about this Egyptian fighter. If it did survive here, it absolutely should sink this German transport on its way up to the Caucasus. This is not crazy to have this British fighter survive, not crazy at all. So if this happens, you now have got an even more robust situation. Controlling the center of the board in the mid game is the United Kingdom's main priority with the armies it has available at its disposal. And that leaves Australia down in the Pacific here. 99% of players pack up an artillery and an infantry and start heading east. I don't think there's any problem with doing that, but for my money, I like to take an infantry and an AA gun. And that's because an AA gun is worth six IPCs, and the Japanese will flip that and use that against you if you don't take it with you. Also, that AA gun will be useful if or perhaps when the UK builds an industry in the Union of South Africa. So that concludes the non-combat movement phase. We'll now go to place units. Of course, we'll drop our new Navy into C zone two. But with two transports, two destroyers, a cruiser, a carrier, a fighter, and a Russian sub, even if the German cruiser survived, the most that can be deployed against us is one German fighter, of course the cruiser, and the bomber. So uh, this is not a threat. Lastly, we place that infantry, and we'll either collect 32 if Egypt didn't fall, or 30 if Egypt did fall. We add that to the one that we saved and we have at least 31 IPCs heading into turn two. All right, I'm gonna transition now into talking about more of the mid and long-term goals of the UK. We spoke a little bit about that down here with Persia, but what is the best way to utilize this power? How can it best contribute to an allied victory? I will say from experience that the Western allies are a difficult pair of powers to master and between the two of them, I think the UK more so. But I've still learned a few things about the UK that I will try to impart to my listeners. First, I highly recommend not building an industrial complex in India on UK's first turn, or ever for that matter. I played many a game against many competent anniversary players and I got that to work exactly zero times. I'm not saying you can't make it work, I just think it's an incredibly difficult and risky thing to do and there's much better and more effective means of fighting the axis that the British player has at its disposal. And in my strong opinion, the mid and long range strategy of the UK player should be assist Russia directly any way you can throughout the game. So we're looking for the opportunity to flip Norway just as soon as we can. Finland, if the Russians don't end up taking it first. Poland is a interesting junction where German troops might coalesce and you should consider destroying those units while they're on their way to the East Front. This is how Britain, in my experience, contributes best towards an allied win. Another mid-game goal to consider heavily is the construction of an industrial complex in the Union of South Africa. The Japanese become a beast in the mid game. After they've got their industrial complexes set up and their supply lines are running, you're gonna feel a lot of pressure coming out of the Indian Ocean against Africa. And so setting up an industrial complex on UK turn two is something to heavily consider. My final notes for Britain are to try to get your transports up to four up in the Atlantic. Okay, four transports, why? Because this industrial complex is an eight capacity complex. You can only build eight units here. And if the war is going well enough, you should be able to produce eight units per turn and deploy them against Germany or into Russia as support. The UK is a very dynamic power to play. It's got a lot going on right at the beginning of the game. 
It's for this reason that I feel like the most experienced player of this game should play as the UK, and it's also the reason why it's my favorite power. I feel like I could keep going on and on about all the things that can come up as opportunities for this power if you're playing it well, but I've got to cut it somewhere, so I feel like I've covered the basics and I'm going to cut it here. So let me know what you think of my UK strategic video. Leave a comment in the description box below. Thanks for watching this. All the best from the good captain, and bye-bye.